My guest for the last of three wonderful visits is the founder and president of Meritus of Freedom in Christ Ministries, Dr. Neil T. Anderson. And he was here one or two years ago mm -hmm. and, um, and said, you know, I told my wife, no more traveling. But God, there's a good but God, uh, prompted Neil to write this amazing memoir, Rough Road to Freedom. It's the whole story of his personal life, his uh, journey in ministry, and uh, what a story, what a teaching. Uh, I'm going now to uh, chapter 10 on paradigm shifts, lots of those. Neil says, I have sometimes wondered why a left-brained aerospace engineer felt led to explore the spiritual realm. I was led into it. <laughs> God. God. <laughs> yeah, I didn't look for this. Honestly, I did not. I, I ran into it in the, the two times that I was on staff on a church, one as a pastor. and I ran into this. I said, God, there's a spiritual problem here, but what do you do with it? I remember one guy in my church when I was a pastor came to me and said, you know, pastor, I got this voice in my head. Really? <laughs> Honestly, I didn't know what that was. Had I even known, I wouldn't have known what to do about it. And so I watched, you know, him be a problem to us and to the church and to his marriage. And, and um, it's painful to recall that because I had an answer at that time. You know, we have an answer, I should say. The whole church has an answer. And so I went to seminary to say, God, you've got to have an answer for it. What is it? And, and the paradigm shifts that I went through during that time were just amazing. Uh, of, of, of not even hardly looking for it. God just kept bringing people to me. And, and it was also a time of testing in many, many ways because... Uh, this was new ground for our seminary. Yeah, the church wasn't embracing this wholeheartedly. No. Uh, you know, if you wanted to be politically correct at that time, you're going to be this psychologist, for instance. And, um, and so exploring the realm of the spiritual was, was, was new. And uh, I got permission to start a Master's of Theology elective. And it just doubled, doubled, doubled almost every year. It was an amazing thing, actually. And I started to see the lives of my students literally change. And last time we talked, I mentioned one of the biggest paradigm shifts was, was having them pray instead of me pray. Think of it this way. You're a parent. You have two children. And the younger brothers are always going to the older brother. You know, go ask dad if I can have, you know, 10 bucks and go to the movies tonight. Now, none of us would accept that. The father would say, go back and tell your brother to come in here himself. Yeah. But we're actually doing this. We, we're looking for somebody else to pray for us as though that would be the answer for me. And yet we're all children of God. And when you, even if you look at James 5, when it says, if any of you are sick or suffering, you should pray. And we, we always totally overlook that when later it says, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man will accomplish much. And so if you want to bring resolution about in people's lives, have them pray. So I but, wrote a, But Neil, <coughs> can I just interrupt you? Sure. In the book, you talk about encountering people where as soon as you challenge them, you know, they might be shaking. There's a spiritual contest going on here. The demon is outing himself. Yep. And maybe that person can't pray in a way. Am I speaking amiss? No, no, you're not. <clears throat> what you're bringing up is a very important issue because I remember I had a, a counselor, professional counselor, Christian man, come to my, uh, my uh, training during that time. He said, I've never seen any evidence of the demonic in 15 years of counseling, but I've been reading up in the New Age, and so therefore, I, you know, I may, and so I'm getting prepared. And I said, well, good for you. Well, he wrote me a letter a month later and said, everybody that I was counseling at that time was being deceived, and so was I. Now, why didn't he see it before? I said, because all he had been taught is to understand, explain, and cope. Only when you move towards resolution do you start seeing opposition. That's why a pastor... And uh, a teacher may not see it. If all you do is teaching and preaching, you, that person is not personally themselves being challenged. I need to make a decision. So when you actually move towards resolution in problems, then you see the opposition. Mm. It's interesting now. When I hear somebody's story, the first question I ask them is, would you like to resolve this? Nobody's ever said no, by the way. <laughs> and I said, with your permission, I'd like to take you through these steps to freedom. Now, what's going to happen here today? It's not what I do. It's what you do. I'm just facilitating a process. This is what I learned. Think of a triangle, and God is at the top, and I'm the encourager. We don't use the word counselor or discipler. Uh, I'm the encourager, and here's the inquirer. And every side of this triangle is a relationship. Now I ask a question, who is responsible for what? What happened is the church 
kind of unwittingly, bought so much from the secular theory. But secular people don't have a triangle. They have a flat line. Now, if you go to the emergency room at a hospital and the line's flat, what are you? <laughs> well, you're dead. And I say this painfully. These people don't know the Lord. So they don't have that as part of their reality. I do. In fact, to be honest with you, uh, they don't have a spiritual reality as well. They come from a Western rational and natural orientation. And you cannot have resolution of people's problems if the only player is, is you and somebody else. It's not going to work. Especially now, when the problem's spiritual. Exactly. And so most important side of this relationship, uh, the triangle is mine with God. Obviously, I, I need to be in right relationship with God. And it's very important how I relate to that other person. And I can learn something from the world on that. I need to be kind, compassionate, non-judgmental, etc. But what am I trying to accomplish? We're all in this mess because of the fall. I'm trying to help this person get back to a righteous relationship with God. God. You know what's amazing about this <clears throat> to, you know, now being you know, over 70 and looking back over my life and all of my journey trying to find answers for people's lives and, and all the paradigm shifts that I had to go through, discovering myself who I was in Christ, uh, getting an understanding of the spiritual world of which we live. And, uh, <clears throat> but I ended up coming full circle. I ended up with a ministry of reconciliation, <laughs> which is the ministry God has given the church. And Every what's the, one of us. What's the answer to conflict resolution? Repentance and faith in God. And, and that's what Jesus said, repent and believe. And Paul preached repentance. And what? that's a weak area for us, repentance. It's missing all over the world. I mean, oh, I repented. What'd you do? I confessed it. When well, I received Christ. <laughs> sure. Right? But see, that's the problem. I mean, we, we didn't go on from there. We just got people into the kingdom. They don't know who they are in Christ. They've never had an understanding of how they can genuinely repent. I'm I always use the word genuine repentance anymore because we're not getting genuine repentance. We got, oh, I'm sorry I got caught. Well, that's not genuine repentance. Genuine repentance is going to bring about a transformation in your life. And we have settled for information as opposed to transformation. Easy believism. Well, I just can believe that. And I said, even there, you know, just mentally assenting to something is not biblical faith. And we've bought that one as well. Oh, I guess I believe that. Well, you live what you believe. People don't always live according to what they profess, but they actually live according to what they believe. So look at their life. They're just living out what they've chosen to believe. We're surely not making possible, personal, all God has made yeah. possible. Well, you had, I had to discover the, the spiritual world that we're living. Had to, to have resolution for people's problems. Just case in point. Uh, I'll take them all the way through the steps to freedom, which is a repentance process, by the way. Uh, what's different about it is they're the ones who pray. God is there and only God can set this person free. And just to highlight, you're identifying <coughs> specific sins. Right. But I'm not. That's the joy of this ministry. They're praying and asking. I haven't pointed out sin in people's life. That's God's role. When you ask that question, who's responsible for what? You get out of the way and let God, you know, this is... This is his child I'm dealing with, by the way. And, and my ministry is reconciliation. But I don't have to point out sin. He will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And when they pray and ask God who they need to forgive, for instance, well, they may talk to you about their dad, as I've talked about my dad, for instance, but another 20 names will come out. How much have you helped them if they forgive their dad, but not the other 20? Some, but not as much as you could have. But when you bring God into the process, he knows everything about that person. Mm -hmm. Everything more than they know about themselves. Every secret sin. <clears throat> and when conviction comes from God, people don't lie to God, but also the power to change is there because it's really coming from God. So when you get people saying, would you like to resolve this thing? And you put them in the presence of God. You pray and ask God and God will show you and God does. It's, it, it is a miraculous thing in a way. Um, is this but, the truth <clears throat> encounter? That's the truth encounter. Well, Introduced in the hugely, well, best-selling <laughs> The bondage breaker. The bondage breaker. Let me, let me point that out because there was another huge paradigm shift. I was trying to get at, at what is this nature of this spiritual conflict that we're in. I mean, we're all tempted. We all feel his accusations and we're all deceived to a certain extent. How does the, the God of this world deceive the whole world? Well, he's a father of lies. So people are buying lies. What, what really sets you free then is truth, of course. But, but <clears throat> all I knew when I first started was the old classic power encounter was here comes this person, you call it the demon, you get their name and rank and try to cast it out. And probably do a lot of shouting. Oh, terrible. 
it's just ugly and it didn't last. You know, he said, I chased off the demon. I said, I think we have a whole different picture because there's not one iota of instruction in the epistles to do that. Not one. We bought that out of the Gospels. We bought it because we just looked at Christ's example, but that's before the cross. Mm -hmm. Everything changes under the new covenant. When it's, we're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. And, and our position, we're all seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And we are commissioned and given the authority to continue His work. See, I think the whole picture shifts after a while. It says, the deliverer is Christ and He's already come and I'll get my information from the Holy Spirit who is the Spirit of truth, who will lead me into all truth. That truth will set me free. And here's the beautiful part about it is, when you have a truth encounter, because this truth that sets people free, you don't lose control. You, you deal only with the person. Now, another motivating factor in my life at that time was I said, that ugly power encounter is not going to happen in anybody's counseling center. It's not going to happen in our Christian schools and most of our churches. Because they don't want, it's ugly. You can get sued or something. People could get hurt. But in this is our movie material we're talking. Yeah. This is exorcisms. Well, I've seen that stuff. I said, but in this way, you never lose control. And God is honored so much more when you do everything in self-control. You don't have to lose control. You can just deal with the person. And you help them make, the, you help them submit to God and resist the devil and they walk off free. In one sense, there's absolutely nothing tr new here. This is not new. I mean, this, this is, this is just old time biblical beliefism that, but it also says I got to get out of my Western rationalism and naturalism and, and develop more of a biblical worldview. Just case in point, Paul says that what you see is temporal, that what you don't see is eternal. Mm -hmm. What's temporal is passing away. All we see in our five senses is the temporal. We don't see the eternal. And we got to trust God to, to, as to what that is because we're just finite people down here struggling along. But you and I are children of God. We're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. We have the authority to do God's will. And when I sit down with another person, I don't usurp God's role. I accept only my role, which is a reconciler. And I help them re repent, which removes the barriers to the intimacy of God. And they walk out free. This is your course, class. And you will enjoy every page of it. I don't always say this, but I, I would really love that everyone read this book. You cannot help but become more of all that God wants you to be in reading it. Take the journey with Dr. Anderson. Rough Road to Freedom, just today. It's our last day making it available to you. God bless you. Thank you on behalf Thank you for of being all my the friend. body of Christ watching today, Dr. Anderson. And love to your dear wife, Joanne, who's allowed you to be all of ours. <laughs> if it wasn't for a discernment, I don't think I'd be here today. She taught me that. Praise God.